Thank you very much for those kind words. It's lovely to be here. I uh, I expected to see just young people, but all I see is gray hair, all my friends that came to my talk. <laughs> Uh, it feels like at home, you know, <laughs> yesterday I had to give a, a keynote at the conference center and this is so much more relaxed, so much uh, nicer to be here with all of you. Uh, when um, Dan invited me to, thank you, dear, invited me to, uh, to the talk and Ray suggested that I could talk about uh, Southern Bluefin Tuna, I said, but I already gave a talk on Southern Bluefin Tuna, Evan, Evan series talk, and I didn't realize that that talk was, uh, 18 years ago. <laughs> uh, and I went into the web and I found the announcement actually from the, from the, from the SAF's uh, website. And you see the title of the talk was Southern Blues, uh, the challenge of managing by consensus to sustain an international tuna fishery. So the tone of the whole talk was very different from what I will uh, like to tell you today. There's been lots of good things happening since then. Uh, the tone reflected at the time the status of the stock that was highly depleted and there were no signs of, of any uh, rebuilding. In uh, This was 2006, I think, that talk. Uh, the median spawning biomass was uh, below 10% of the, of the uh, B0, the unexploited level. The stock had been listed by IUCN as critically endangered in 1996, uh, now has been uh, reassessed as endangered. By the turn of the century, the Commission, the C Commission for the Conservation of Southern Bluefin Tuna, it really fitted the generalized view that uh, the regional fisheries management organizations were not achieving the goals of sustainable management of highly migratory stocks. There was uh, a very dysfunctional advisory process for the science advisory process. There was high uncertainty and lack of agreement on the best scientific advice uh, for setting quotas. The, uh, the commission decision making was based on consensus with always resulted in the lowest common denominator and in um, very unresponsive management. Problems with the implementation and compliance that were apparent later uh, were, were, also, were also there. So this was the concluding slide of my, uh, of my presentation then that said the question remains as to whether concerted management action will be possible for the fishery or the fishery will continue to climb to the point of bioeconomic equilibrium. So that's the Southern blues of the time. Uh, and I really, a lot of uh, substantial pro progress had been made when I gave that talk, but it was still very unclear what would happen. Um, after that, and I'm gonna advance to the conclusions of my talk, there's been a lot of positive things happening on the science uh, side. The restructuring of the scientific advisory process, the adoption of a fully tested harvesting strategy, what I will call as, uh, I will refer to as management procedure, new methods that were developed and implemented for uh, estimating recruitment and spawning stock biomass, and a sustained commitment and adequate funding to develop and implement all the above components. So that'll be, the end, and, and now in my talk, I'm gonna sort of uh, walk you through the different the different things that that, that have been accomplished. So the, I'll first give an overview of the research, the industry, and the management of the of the fishery. I'll describe briefly the history of contentious assessments and the management disputes. I talk about the restructuring of the scientific advisory process, and then I'll spend most of my time talking about how the uh, we change the framework from providing advice on the annual total allowable catches to providing advice on the management procedures as being a key to turning all the other problems around. Uh, the, this is a very exceptional species. Uh, it, it's unlike the tropical tuna, it lives uh, up to 40 years, gets big, 200 kilograms, more than two meters long. They don't breed until about age 10. They are warm blooded, they're hardly migratory and they are very fast swimmers. They, it's one of the most valuable fish in the world. Almost all is sold in the Japanese sashimi market for incredible prices. There's only one known spawning ground, which is uh, close to Indonesia. And from, the, from there, the, the juveniles uh, migrate to the south of the Australian uh, coast. They move into the Great Australian uh, Bight at ages two and three, and some of them migrate west to Africa. 
From the Australian Bight, they are dispersed to the Southern Oceans where they are caught by the high seas longline fleets. The industry has two primary components. One is the longliners, uh, where there's Japan, Korea, Taiwan, New Zealand, and the other is the purseiners uh, from Australia. And there is also the Indonesian fishery that catches um, the southern bluefin in the, in the spawning grounds, which are the, within the EZ of, of Indonesia. When you look at the uh, the plot, the bar plots, you see the difference in the in the age composition of the uh, surface fishery in the light gray, which mainly catches uh, fish uh, of age two, three, and four, varies a bit depending on the year. And the others are the long line, which catches fish that are much larger. So the Australian uh, per se fishery, they they get these young uh, fish, they tow them towards the coast, and they uh, put them in floating cages where they are fed for several months before they're sent to the market, mainly in Japan. <laughs> the, um, the, the, the stock was heavily fished in the past with uh, catches that reached 80,000 tons in the early 60s. Now they are down to six, 17,600 tons. Uh, and of course, this is what causes the, uh, the highly depletion of, of the stock that we saw in the, by the end of the, of the century. The stocks are managed by the Commission for the Conservation of Southern Bluefin Tuna. The members are Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Korea, Indonesia, South Africa, European Union, and Taiwan in the Extended Commission. The, the CCSBT sets the quota for each country and the allocations are, are predetermined. So they are also discussed, but they tend to have a default allocation that they, they usually come back to it. The, um, the management in the past used to follow what we call the conventional best assessment approach. So this is the cycle of uh, annual management when they collect data. The important things here are the two on the bottom when they do the stock assessments. In the past, they were done independently by Japan and Australia. They, uh, they would present the results to the stock assessment group, the stock assessment group to the uh, scientific uh, committee that would make the recommendations to the commission and the commission will make the decisions on the annual TSC based on consensus. This approach has a lot of limitations. What we call, uh, when I say the best assessment approach, that means that the management advice is based on estimates of stock size that are produced by assessments, that the base case model, which is chosen among the many possible models that you could be uh, feeding to the historical data. So the scientists have to choose what they consider the best model and use that for the recommendation. This, uh, this had a lot of problems and, and very serious in the case of Southern Bluefin Tuna. It's very hard to decide which is the best model. There is a risk that the best model is wrong and it would be consistently wrong if you keep applying the same model over and over. This, um, it brings a lot of uh, instability to the TAC advice, especially when there are changes in the assumptions and what is considered the best model from year to year. And, and because of those changes that cannot be anticipated, that means the approach you cannot, under that approach, you cannot really estimate what are the risks uh, for the future. The other limitations that the Southern Bluefin tuna had were more related to the wide distribution of the stocks. Like many of the tuna uh, fisheries, it's very hard to have indications, indicators of abundance that are actually global. So usually you have a patchwork of, of, of indications, but, but you don't have, and you don't have fishery independent indices of, of abundance. Again, this was how it was in the past when, when we started to, to work with the commission. Uh, what this, the, 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 bar, the bar plot in the, um, at the bottom shows how the area that was actually fished, this is the number of cells, the one mile, I think it's by, my one by one, we call them one by one. I think it's one by one. My cells were fish, so it counts the number of cells that were actually covered by the Japanese fleet, the long life fleet, which is the one we use for the assessment. And you see how, when the quotas were introduced, the catches were reduced, there was a, 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 a strong contraction of the area fish that brought problems for the for the. Um, for the Japanese, because it's like there were a lot of empty cells that used to be fish and now they were no longer fish and it was difficult to, to interpret how, you know, to, to, to know whether there was just a contraction of the fish, the, of the fleet and there were fish there or the contraction of the fleet also reflected the fact that the, uh, the abundance was coming down and the, the spatial distribution was contracted. 
So this was one of the main sources of uncertainty in the assessment that, that people could not, in the scientific committee, could not um, reconcile. So overall, the system failed. There were major scientific disagreements about the impact of quotas on stock projections, which were mostly due to the different interpretation of the CPUE that had all these, these problems. The assessments became very confrontational and there were no agreement on what advice to provide to the commission. The advisory process was poorly structured when science and management were not clearly separated. And managers were subject to very different pressures in response to the contrasted economic realities of the different industries. So Australia was satisfied with status quo at the time, but Japan was looking for a quota increase. As a result, the commission could never agree on a TAC. In uh, 1998, 1999, Japan conducted unilateral experimental fishing, arguing that the data that would be collected could help to fill these gaps in the, uh, the empty cells of the CPUE. So, so that would justify catching some, some additional tuna. After the negotiations failed, then Australia and New Zealand brought the dispute before the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, which was the end of the dysfunctional. You can imagine the impact that I had on the whole, the whole process. Uh, 2000 brought some good new faces. Uh, I don't know if you recognize them. It's been a while. <laughs> So there was a review panel that uh, recommended that, that the structure of the process was, was bad because they were rotating chairs between the member countries and that, that would never work. So they recommended that independent chairs were hired for the stock assessment group and the, uh, the scientific committee. And they also appointed this uh, uh, advisory panel of externals of which uh, only Jim and I survived the 20 something years. So we're still, we're still involved. Um, in 2001, and this was uh, critically important, the Commission approved a multi-year plan for the Scientific Committee to design a rebuilding strategy for SBT. What the managers wanted, they wanted to rebuild the stock by 2020. Tough luck, that never happened. It was impossible to, <laughs> to, have, to have that rebuilt, even if we shut down the fishery. They uh, wanted to reduce the short-term risks to the stock. They wanted to hold catches at the current level or higher if the stock increased and reduce year-to-year -year variability in, in catches. So that was the wish list that, that they come up with. The, what we did was uh, implemented a management strategy evaluation where the goal was to design a management procedure that was as robust as possible to the uncertainties that we had identified and that would achieve rebuilding while maintaining a viable industry. So scientists, the way we did it was to involve all the scientists, all the member scientists, and the externals in the design of this uh, simulation testing protocol. So, so we all agree how we would play the game and, and what would be the process to, uh, to choose this robust uh, or to recommend some robust management procedure. There was a common uh, software that was developed by consultant. First was Vivian Hayes, then was uh, Trevor. Trevor. So <laughs> they all wanted to hear a story that they know that so they're here. Uh, and, and the fact that it was a common software meant that all the member countries and people that were willing to participate, trying out their own uh, candidate management procedures, they could, and they would be using the same exact software. So they did, and they would come with results to the, uh, to the commission, and we would try to evaluate the performance of, of the different uh, proposals and try to refine jointly through a series of, of, of workshops. The approach that we follow to try to design a rebuilding strategy really contrasts a lot with the approach that is, I think, is still the case in the US, despite some of our recommendations, Andre. I'm, I'm sorry to say. Uh, it, it really differs. You know, in the States, uh, you once the stock is declared to be overfished, then you're then you have to rebuild, you have to implement a rebuilding plan. And there is a 10 year rule, which is probably still in place that, uh, that as long as you can do it, so it's not like the wish that the commissioners had, you should rebuild it in 10 years. This was totally different the way we did it. The rebuilding goals were not set in advance. So they tried with this 2020, but, but as soon as that was, uh, was proved to be unachievable, then, then they gave up, they were not, they were not uh, giving a rebuilding target. 
we handle the uncertainty very different from the conventional approach also that is uh, more common in the states the emphasis here was on testing the performance of this alternative candidate management procedure as a basis for choosing the harvesting strategy instead of having these very uh, binding rules when i say fully specified and that's a very uh, critical difference from the other approach is that everything that goes from the data that you collect to how you analyze the data, how you put it in this equation to finally spit out a TAC recommendation. So nothing will be changed as long as you're using this management procedure. So it's uh, this was sort of like just showing the equation, simply showing that this is a, it's a very simple function what we uh, that, that I'm showing here that we use that was a function of the CPUE, the one that had problems, so we had to admit a lot of uh, different alternatives or CPUE. There was an aerial survey that was used to um, estimate the size of the recruits. So, so the planes would be uh, flying on the Australian Bay to, to, um, to count the number of juveniles. We use the catch and we use the age composition of the catch. That was the structure of the first uh, procedure we tested. The, one, the other difference is how we handle the uncertainty. You try to ensure that the simulation models uh, encompass all the full uncertainty that you were able to identify. And this is a very hard problem, is how to bound the uncertainty in these types of uh, management strategy evaluation. And because you also need to assign some possibility uh, a scenario uh, to the different scenarios that you consider. In our case, um, one of the key uncertainties is the productivity of the stock. You can fit different models with different, uh, what we call stiffness parameters, that is sort of the, the productivity of the stock that will fit the data pretty well, and they have totally different implications in terms of how hard you can harvest the stock. So we have different axes of uncertainty. The way we did it is instead of having one model with just parameter uncertainty, we have a collection of models that span a range of the steepness and natural mortality and the alternative interpretations of CPUE. And then there were also a lot of robustness tests that are like more like what if scenarios. What if the recruitment drops below historical level? What if this and that and that? And how, how robust will be the candidate uh, management procedures to these things? The operational goals, as I said, were not set in advance. The rebuilding targets and the timeframes were not specified by the commissioners. They um, were set following an iterative process and extensive consultation with the, with the scientific committee. The scientific committee was quantifying the various trade-offs that were associated with the different rebuilding timeframes, and the commission would decide on rebuilding targets after consideration of these trade-offs. So, so instead of saying you have 10 years to rebuild, say, let's wait and see how we trade, what are we getting into when we say we want to rebuild in 10, 20 years. So that's the, the process. The primary trade-off was, of course, between the catch and the rebuilding rate. So you could rebuild faster or, or slower, but of course the penalty would be on the, on the fishery. The secondary trade-off is once you tune the procedure, so you force them to all rebuild at some rate for a given time frame, then you can do it with initial pain, we call late or early pain. So you can do it fast and get out of the risky zone immediately with a lot of penalty and then end up in the same place, or you can go more gradually so as to favor the stability of the industry. So these are the trade-offs that we were evaluating uh, through the simulations, the main trade-offs. There were others like variability in the catches, but these two were the more important ones. So finally, in 2011, the, um, the commission adopted what we call the Bali management procedure, because that's where we were when we, uh, we came up with the combining different things from different from the candidates that different people have developed, we, we, we came up with this um, procedure that, 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 the, that the commission finally accepted. The idea was to rebuild the stock to an interim target. So because they couldn't determine or we couldn't determine how fast it could go and where the BMSY would be, whether you know we didn't have it, the commission said, well, let's, let's go gradually. So we have an interim rebuilding target that was 20% of V0 by 2035, and they had to be achieved with a 70% probability. The other uh, thing that they tried is that they wanted to reduce the interannual variability in the TAC. So we were doing um, TACs by blocks of three years and also restrict the changes from block to block. The ballot procedure was implemented successfully and it was used to set the TACs 
until 2020. So, so it really lasted a long time with the original parameters that we, that we were um, specifying when it was adopted. The stock rebuilt from less than 10% unexploited levels to close to that 20% that was the, the, the interim rebuilding target. There was um, the reduced assessment workload allowed the scientists to spend more time doing other things. So there was this development of very innovative methods to estimate abundance. The methods uh, based on genomics, the closed skin mark recapture methods to estimate the abundance of the uh, spawners. And then lately, more recently, the use of gene tagging to estimate recruitment. So instead of doing that aerial survey, they are now using gene tagging to estimate the recruits. And, and this is the paper by Mark Bravington and co-authors where the, where the method was, uh, was published. There was a second round of MP testing that was initiated in 2017. So the, the MP is not supposed to be cast in tone forever. With all these changes that we have and new information, new data and new, um, and the achievement of this interim target, it was time to actually do it again. So we did it. Now bringing the new data and, and, and using different simulation models, the scientific committees uh, wanted a single MP from us and they just were selecting how fast uh, to continue the rebuilding. And this is uh, Jim's uh, summary, summary plot where we were not only using performance statistics, but we were looking at the qualitative behavior of these procedures as you project the stocks over time. So the smiles and the, there were four candidate procedures and you see the winner was the, the yellow one that had more smiley faces than the others. And this was actually very useful to explain the, the actual kind of quantitative, qualitative behavior that we, uh, that we were considering as a group to recommend that that procedure uh, would move forward. And that's what we did. We only recommended one procedure without recommending how fast the room. So that was a decision for the commission. The procedure was that, but they, then they said that the, um, they uh, proposed a range of initial rebuilding targets. So we ended up evaluating two of them and they finally chose one, the first one. So, so uh, to reach 30% of B0 by 2035. Now, despite the best efforts that we did to include all sources of uncertainties, the reality is full of surprises. In the wise word of Carl Walters, often much nastier than scientists can anticipate. So the idea is that we need a safety net. See, the, uh, the MP works, but you need some form of a safety net to, uh, in case these nasty things are not so nasty, happen. So the decision, the whole approach has two components. One is the management procedure, which works as an autopilot that will, that will tell you the TAC. But the other is a very structured process that we call the meta rule process that is what we use to check whether there is exceptional circumstances. And for that, we mean that things have gone out of the bounds of the testing. So, so that uncertainty, something happened that is not, has not been considered during the testing. So this is the kind of thing you don't need to go into details, but every year we look at indicators, every three years we do full stock assessments and depending on what we see, then eventually we decide whether we need to get out of the MP and do something else. So probably discuss and set a TAC, or despite the fact that there is exceptional circumstances, we can still use the management procedure. Carl was right. Exceptional circumstances were very common. There was nothing exceptional about them. And the, and the commission had to experience all of them, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So I'll start with the ugly. Even before we uh, moved to recommend, I think we... Yeah, when we first, when we finished the first uh, round of, of testing, which took four years, because people say, well, it took you uh, like 11, 10 years to, no, no, it actually took us four years. But when we did recommend the MP, then they came up with these uh, allegations of substantial undercuts that forced us back to reconsider the whole MSC process. So we had to start all over again. In 2006, there was a recruitment failure that was way lower and consistently lower, like three or four years of low recruitment that were much lower than we had seen historically. So again, they were out of the bounds. The aerial survey was uh, discontinued. So that was also another exceptional circumstance. There was poor performance of CPUE. This is very recent. The CPUE algorithm that we had used all the time there was one year it really performed poorly in one of these uh, cells that were empty. 
it predicted huge CPUE and that, that ruined the whole the whole standardization procedure. So that again was a, was another exceptional circumstance. The good was the availability of new of new data, like the closed kin mark recapture data, that uh, and the gene tagging. So the incorporation of the closed kin mark recapture data into the assessment resulted in a 76 increase in the estimated stock biomass. So this is the green is the old, the gray is the after the closed kin was was incorporated. So clearly it was an exceptional circumstance. It was completely out of the of the envelope of the of the uh, that we had used to 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 choose the valley procedure so the exceptional circumstances were declared here again but the beauty of the management procedure approach that works incrementally is that we could still work with them with the valley procedure so despite this huge change in absolute uh, biomass we were able to still continue using the same procedure without even changing the parameters why because it would be gradually going up if it need to so overall, some salient conclusions, the scientific consensus was really facilitated by restructuring the advisory process and by bringing external scientists that would endorse with some arbitration power. So this was us, Ray has some, I have to tell this, this Ray has some, <laughs> some great anecdotes when there was one that was a very controversial issue and the chair of the committee was really afraid that the rest of the meeting will go in that discussion. So the panel, move away and we discuss what the advice will be from the panel. And because our terms were like, if they did not agree, we would provide the advice directly. So that's that's what the contract said. So we came up with that advice. And when he was going to present it, he said, well, this is our advice. We're not going to argue about details. You either take it or you leave it. And so people went like, I, I went like, oh, you know, we have not decided that will happen. So that saved the rest of the meeting because people say, well, yes, we're we're with you. And and the and the uh, and the chair of the committee went okay. So well, adopting a management procedure was very important because it really changed the focus of the uh, scientific debate from very inconclusive arguments about what the TAC should be next year and how the stock would respond and what was the best assessment to actually discussing what scenarios we should be using in the testing and what should be the protocol used in the management strategy evaluation, which was a much less controversial thing, and that brought people together in a much nicer way. We tried to also encourage participation by all members. So there was a lot of ownership in the end because everybody was sort of playing the game. There were many, many teams actually proposed different, different procedures. So we had to reduce them gradually to something that was a bit more manageable for, for the evaluation. And that was, that was uh, actually very good. So what this experience indicates is that the management strategy evaluation allow for quantification of real trade-offs so that the rebuilding goals could be established by CC, SBT, by the commission after they were weighing the short-term risks and costs associated with more or less aggressive rebuilding policies. The Bali procedure proved to be very robust to major assessment updates, that's also very important. So it was avoiding the abrupt changes in TAC that would have resulted had the best assessment model be used instead. Having an MP in place reduced the assessment workflow and then it allowed all these other great developments of methods to be implemented. The outlook now is much more positive. There's been clear signs of rebuilding. The gray is what's been uh, it's up to 2020, what I had is, uh, is uh, and you see the bending of the, of the spawning biomass and then the projection is how the procedure is projecting to reach this 30% uh, target that the commission set for us. These, uh, these positive things have been acknowledged by, by other organizations. They are not only uh, true for, for for Southern Bluefin Tuna, this is the Harvest Strategy Org, which is supported, I think, by, by Pew. That uh, They say that adopting these kinds of uh, approaches increases transparency, predictability, and market stability. They avoid costly and highly politicized negotiations. They facilitate swift, efficient management to ensure resource health and industry profitability. The industry likes the approach because of all the planning that, that they uh, they can do effective uh, effectively implementing the precautionary approach because you can really estimate the risks that you cannot when you're not really allowing for 
all these possible changes in models and assumptions. And they, the procedures are designed to comply with the management goals. The good news is that other tuna fisheries are also following this same approach. There is now, uh, there's been a lot of support from, from a GF uh, UN project to, to help the different RFMOs move in this direction. The Marine Stewardship Council now requires RFMOs to adopt harvest strategies for all tuna fisheries. So, so there is a, a, a great incentive for them to, to put their act together. I'm not going to get into the details, but many of the, uh, of the RFMOs are sort of making gradual progress. So with this, I'm going to close. I'd like uh, to acknowledge the support of the Commission. Many colleagues who were part of this learning journey who contributed in many ways to the much better outlook of the stock and the fisheries. This picture is just the, uh, the last meeting that we had last June. So thanks to SAFS for hosting all our modeling working groups. You treat us so well that we'll keep coming. Okay. So as long as you let us. So thank you all for your attention. Happy to take questions. Andre. <laughs> Fantastic talk. Um, I'm going to tell you something you probably don't know. I'm to blame for the listing, the critically endangered listing in 1996. <laughs> what about the rest? You could have done better. <laughs> uh, he said to me, maybe he had his to blame as well. He sent me to a meeting and we listed it as critically endangered. Um, but I do think. Well, he was. It certainly was, yeah. I, yeah, anyway, sorry. Um, but um, you gave a couple of different reasons why things work for Southern Bluefin, and we've tried many combinations. I, I would really like you to sort of take us a little further on the, the sort of Damocles effect, which is essentially if they didn't agree with you, you won the game. And I think looking at all the other tuna fisheries and similar problems, unless you've got I'm thinking penguins here, yeah? unless you've got someone who can come in and say, this is what's going to happen unless you guys play the game, the progress is really slow. So I think that arbitration thing is, in my opinion, probably the key thing that allowed you to do all the good stuff. Without that, I think they'd still be discussing the agenda from the 1995 meeting. Um, <laughs> well, there was a famous meeting that they could, I think they couldn't even agree on the agenda. That's how it was. Four days to agree on the agenda. Three days, not so great. when I say it's functional, I, I mean it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, I, I think, well, it's, 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 I think it, it, it was very important that uh, it was also very important that there was, even though there was this agreement, all the scientists or the scientists and the main players at the time that were not, you know, the commission expanded and brought in new members. But at the time, the main scientists were all on board. And that's something that, that is not always the case. So they were all on board yeah. about, about mm -hmm. getting, not, you know, they wouldn't agree on the actual best model, but they were all on board in terms of uh, wanting to do this management strategy evaluation. And that helps a lot because they were all contributing. There were disparities of levels. So that was a bit of a hard thing um, that we had to, you know, for me, it was, I was coordinating the process. And, and for me, it was very important that people felt that they were part of it. So, so you had to, you know, some people were ready to run faster than others. And, but, it, but three countries participated with many teams. So, so it was really well, well, well done. Jim? Yeah, thanks. I wonder how much you think about um, being lucky. When you go back and look at those projections historically, they're based on probability this is be on average good, but we could have, we couldn't, have, you know, if we hadn't had these recruitments that weren't that predictable, right? What if we, what would be the scenario if we had been on the lower 20th percentile of those projections instead of above the median kind of thing? Well, we were lucky in a way, we were not lucky in other ways. So, you know, I tend to think that things compensated, but truly to have signs of recovery that improves everything because the catch has been going up. And if it had not been going, and the, and the procedures were actually predicting that it could stay uh, the same. And over the last, uh, I think it was uh, three years ago, we, we had some, some issues because there were expectations 
that the, uh, the TAC would be up with the new Cape Town procedure is the last one we have. So after the Bali came the Cape Town and, and the catch did not go up by a tiny bit. It was not reaching. And that was, that was controversial for, for the countries that really wanted an increase. So yes, yes, probably would have, it w- it w- we would have not navigated so easily and so you know, everybody happy. Yeah. Yes. How did you resolve the underreporting issue? Result. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, no, apparently there were a lot of restructuring. You know, this is something that, that is done by the country. So, so once you're given the TAC, then the different countries have to see how they enforce it. So I'm not I'm not on top of the details of how what Japan did, but they changed completely their way. He he Kurato san, where are you? You he, he would be able to explain better what Japan did to actually decrease the problem. The way we dealt with that, that that was in 2005 when we had to go back and do it again, where we because it was no accepted uh historical catch and the, it was a very sizable amount, like twice. So, so it really forced us to reconsider all the models. So we were using scenarios. There were two panels that did a review of the market and based on the review of the market, they came up with some estimates of the, uh, of the, uh, of, of the size of the, of the overcatch. So based on those estimates, we had a couple, a couple um, time series of catches. The worst part was that we didn't know whether the overcatch was affecting the CPUE or not. So whether, the CPU was clean because it could have been a subset of the uh, of the of, of the boats that were fishing legally, or it was actually affecting the effort as well. So so we also had alternative scenarios. So we had to explode the the number of scenarios that we were we were considering in in the testing. Bill. I'm going with the faces I know okay. first. I think <laughs> this is unfair for all the students. Yeah, yeah. You should you should do so it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> how did the evaluation software work? I mean, what sort of tests did the, did the software put the proposed procedures through? What sort of what? In, what sort of test did the, the evaluation software perform? I mean, it's all, all done in software to choose to judge candidate procedures. Yes, I'm just wondering how the how the so how the software worked, what it what it tested, how it tested. Oh, uh, we have a, a model that is the same one we use for stock assessment. It's an ADMB model, and then there is a projection model from that, and we have a, a what we call a reference set of uh, of models. So we try to use um, MCMC initially. And we failed. There was problems with convergence, especially when the recruitment failure mm-hmm. took place. So we ended up instead of instead of uh, having um, parameter uncertainty through MCMC, we had to do this grid where we are crossing all these values of steepness and M's and C uh, alternative uh, CPUs. Now we're uh, we're in the process of moving to TMB, and Darcy Weber is uh, just coded the uh, the model, so he's matching the results that we have with the old model. So we're uh, hopefully go, go back to doing MCMC, probably not for the whole thing. We'll still plan to keep the uh, steepness as something that we'll treat discreetly and then and then do MCMC on each of the values. Is that sort of what you were after? No. <laughs> okay. Um, so like in the context of like implementing this in like different fisheries or like with a different like fish, like this sort of management plan, like with different ecological and like economic differences, how do you think like designing and implementing and monitoring in your in that context? See what we call the, the testing models are what we call the operating models. You can build whatever you want because it's not bound by whether you can estimate the parameter or not. So you can actually bring alternative scenarios of any kind, bring in economics if that's interesting. So the, the goals and the, uh, depends on, on the goals and things that people care about. And then you have performance statistics from that operating model that is mimicking the possible realities. And then you come up with the, with the, with the statistics. But yeah, there is no, there's no limit in, in, in what, except for numerical or, or, or computing time, but, but that's becoming less and less of a problem. 
Um, with your current hindsight and like understanding how successful this was, is there anything you would have done differently or something you wish you had known at the time? I don't, I'm not the type of person that looks back to say <laughs> because probably I would have done lots of things differently. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, you know, it would have been nice to, to anticipate some of the things, but but we didn't know. So we did as good as we can. No, I'm, I I really don't, don't know what I would have done differently. Trevor. Um, I'd like to say, just to pick up something that, that, that Andre pointed out, which is everybody was afraid of you. <laughs> <laughs> But, but in, all, in all seriousness, <laughs> in a nice way, I certainly was in a really nice way. I mean, in all seriousness, like having someone who's a strong leader that everybody respects, who's impartial, um, I think was critical to the process because without someone that, like, you know, you're joking about the sort of democracy, but you know, um, but well, it's, yeah, and especially when say. there was such a different level in terms of technical capabilities, yeah, so. That makes it even worse because the people who have more technical capabilities will tend to dominate. Yeah. If you put that and then on top of our language issues and all, all kinds of things, I think we were trying to level in the, uh, yeah. what is it? But I, but I think it was, something like that. I think, I think the key is that the strong leadership um, in running the meeting is absolutely critically important when you have these two, if you have multiple competing groups, having someone who's impartial, who's seen as impartial, but also as a strong leader, really critically for them. And that entirely is, is your contribution to the process. So, no, it's the, yeah. the whole panel. The whole panel. <laughs> Any other students from the class? Uh, with your background perspective, how do you think your applications are from UNCA, UNFSA? Specifically, yeah. how is it going? If you can speak up a bit, because I'm... I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with your background and perspective, how do you think the applications of the UNCA and UNFSA agreements specifically uh, help with the sustainability of fisheries overall? What do I think about the agreements on the and the overall impact on the trans? I'm I'm not following the question. It needs to clarify what he means by the U UNFSA and the the, the acronyms. Did yeah, did so I use that? The stock agreement? The stock the fish stock agreement, right? Yeah. Did I use that acronym? I forgot. No, he's asking ah. whether whether those agreements were important in this process. And the answer is probably no. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, as, as you see, I, I, I don't even remember the, the acronym. Yeah. So yeah, right here in the flu hat. Um Thank you for the talk. I got here a little bit late, and um, I was talking about how you would approach uncertainty a little differently. Could you just give a quick little rundown again how you um, yeah, decided upon the different uncertainty, uh, uncertainty sources? How I would approach what differently? A big question. Do you want to know um, how you decided on the sources of uncertainty? Oh, uh, well, there are some that are, that are classical, huh? So like this, the productivity, that's uh, the difficulty is to, to bound it because we distrusted the likelihood as a basis. So the, how, how well they were able to fit the data with, with, we really did not want to go with the likelihood. So we had to provide a range based on, we did a voting around, like the first time it was sort of, and we did a voting around the room. We we heard all the arguments that different people had for the different values, and then we put, and there was a lot of agreement. So we ended up just having a range of, of, of possibilities. Then the, the critical, the, it was obvious that CPUE was one that would be important. There were many more initially, but we only kept the ones that, that were relevant in terms of affecting performance. So if there was something that said, well, yes, but, these parameters should be that, or the maturity should be whatever, but it wasn't changing things, then we would drop it. So we, we reduce it to the ones that were critical. Then natural mortality, there's tagging, and tagging is providing information on some of the uh, the natural mortality parameters, but but there's still a lot of a lot of uncertainty. Thank you. Well, I uh, thank you for the talk. It was, it was great. And uh, 
I'm the U.S. Federal Commissioner okay. for the U.S. Uh, Whiting Treaty with Canada. And one of the things that you, uh, one of your early slides, uh, I, I uh, was amazed. Uh, you had just that one goal. And, you know, we've been doing an MSE for about 10 years. Yeah. More than that. Okay. <laughs> so uh, 10 years and uh, we uh, have five principles, five goals, and each of those goals have some sub goals in there. And I'm just wondering, how did you get to one kind of major it, goal. It wasn't, it wasn't one, it wasn't one, it was the, and we did have to um, see what happens when you have many and, and people asking for things. Sometimes they say, no, I want a higher probability of rebuilding, but a shorter and a longer. So it's a time frame. the probability. We convinced them that, that you could do with just changing the, uh, say, please stay with the median, don't, don't ask me for different probabilities and different time frames. Just stay with the median and let's just vary the time frame because actually it will be the same. We could have combinations of the others. And, and I'm, I'm not sure they understood my argument, but I said it so firmly to the to the commissioners. We had a strategic, whatever that was, uh, that, that they said, well, she must know what she's talking about. <laughs> yeah, you know, there is a limit to what, People, there is a lot of turnover of, of managers. So, so there's, there's some that understand better, but we ended up doing a lot of work for nothing because they were combining different things that they wanted to see and said, well, but these are equivalent. These couple of things that cancel each other and you end up in the same place. I saw a similar problem in the Atlantic Bluefin Tuna MSC that just uh, finished. Uh, they adopted uh, an MP a year ago, two years ago, sort of. And they had many, many of the goals were actually very correlated. So you're measuring risk. You can measure risk in so many ways. So they had that, 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 that. And I don't think that, you know, you end up having the ones, but there has to be iterations with the managers where you're trying to show the results and show why, you know, you don't need to really try all that. I'm thinking maybe we need to get a contract with you to scare them into <laughs> Go with my finger <laughs> then. <laughs> Ray. I, I had two questions. I think my favorite would be, so there was a big shock when it was discovered there was a lot of unreported catch. But as far as I know, there still is the assumption that the Australians are continuously underestimating their catch. Yes. Is that how do you deal with that? We um they were they refuse to adopt the right way to count fish. And they have a method that we know is biased. Yeah. <laughs> they 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 count the fish. What is it? They 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 know how much fish they get from the ponds and they count the fish but they don't weigh them when they transfer them to the pond. So the size of the fish is the source of the problem. So that's what Ray is talking about. So they have a sample of fish when they are in the pond, and we have evidence that that sample is very biased. So there's been a lot of pressure for Australia to put in um, stereo videos, and it's been shown to work in many other places that, that you can actually do measurement very well. And, and to tell the truth, and that's what we think, they're dragging their feet, and, and we never get the stereo video in place. So the way we dealt with that is assume a value that was sort of consistent with, uh, you know, there's a range of estimates and depending on the year, sometimes the estimate is better that usually Japan would come with estimate uh, of, of how much they are under reporting. So we actually inflate the catch by 20% and they accepted that and we shift. <laughs> so we probably means Chances are that, that it's actually worse. Uh, <laughs> and we also shift the size composition in order to match that. that uh, yeah. uh, we have robustness tests to, to deal with the probability that, that it, it may be higher than that. But that's, that's what we're doing. Yeah. Oh, one last question. Um, when assessing um, like the best management practices for uh, certain stocks, what are the main factors that you consider, like for respective stocks? And like, because I assume that different like stocks would have um, varying management like capabilities. 
And then also you mentioned in your talk um, about how your model would like take into consideration um, extenuating like circumstances and how like other factors that the model didn't consider. How might um or sorry, um that's a very nice question, but uh in the future of using this model, how might you adapt it um to consider uh like certain factors like climate change or other changes to the environment or that could affect the stocks, how would you shift your model and how would you change it to um, predict that? Yeah, uh, we are not hoping to predict the climate change. We're hoping that, uh, that we will be able to affect it if there's some persistent drop or increase or whatever in productivity so that we can adapt the model. And that's what I see some of the research that has been conducted is indicating that it's not that we you know, need to anticipate uh, what the climate will do to the, to the stock, but it may be enough to have policies that are just based on the current, current status. And that's hard enough, if not that, because it's not compounding. So the advantage of this approach is that at least you can come up with these alternative scenarios when you're doing your testing. So it's not that it's going to shift like your best model. Like I remember one of the cases that we we reviewed in, in our review report was one where they had two interpretations of the data. One was a, a, a drop in productivity through some environmental effect, and the other was a stock of some fish. One year the model favor was this, and the other year was that, and that meant you know, catches were coming down, the cases had to come down, 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 because the stock was interpreted as being overfished, and then the next year they said no, it's High probability of the an environmental effect and the tax go back up. But that, that is unacceptable, I think, in terms of uh, providing a, that good advice. So at least with this approach, you can you can represent the different scenarios. You had the first question? Or yeah, it was just like the, what were like the main factors that you used to build them up? Like how like, them up. like for like stocks, like what do you look at? Like they like different stocks, right? Like I would assume that the stocks are different, like different environment conditions or different like um, mm -hmm. conditions for each of their respective areas. Like, what are the factors that you look that like comparing different stocks? Like, this is a single stock. Or, like, but like if you were to use another stock, like or another species. So. Yeah. Well, usually what you do is a stock assessment. That's your start. If you have good historical data, then you try to fit the the models to the historical data, and that will attempt to bound the parameters. The models are, they may be a bit different, but that's, you know, stock assessment models are, you know, you model the crop or you know, there is a lot of commonality in the, in the models and for species in general. But you try to, to fit the historical data to come up with, with the parameters. That's the first thing you do. Of course, if there is totally different life histories, then, then yes, you need a different kind of model. If this is a, a, a fish that switches, uh, Sex is well, that's a different like model completely, but but this is just a standard, a standard type of stock assessment model. You may have a uh, you know slower dynamics, and then you can live with the uh, uh, steps of, of one year. This is one that has uh, semesters, other tuna, tropical tunas that we use three months because because the dynamics is much faster. So there's things like that that you that you will have to consider. Uh, reflecting the, the characteristics of your and future. All right, before we thank Anna one more time, uh, I just want to acknowledge a few people here for uh, helping pull out this year's Bevan series. This is our 10th week in a row. Uh, to start with uh, thanking the Bevan Endowment, who uh, provides funds for bringing